Welcome to the Visual Principles Lecture, Part 1, for the Art 161 Graphic Design course. In this lecture, we're going to be covering points, lines, and planes as design elements, and looking at the design principles and how we can use the articulation of these different elements with restricted number of shapes to start to articulate these different principles. So to start, we need to talk about points, lines, and planes. And really, everything we design is compromised of some combination of these elements usually. If we break it down to its most simplest forms, even more organic shapes typically can be identified through these basic shapes as well. And that's really what we're going to focus on in this assignment. When we talk about points, we're talking about a position in space, and it takes the form of a dot. And through scale, positioning, and the relationships to the surrounding elements, a point can express its own identity or it can tend to melt into the crowd. And when we think about a series of points, this is what forms a line. And a mass of points forms either a texture potentially or some sort of shape or plane. And tiny points of varying size create different shades of gray, such as in old newspapers and the way that we saw those images. And in typography, the point of a period is the definition of the end of a line of text. So there's many uses of different points within design. And we can see an accumulation of points in the negative space within these points starts to articulate these different letter forms as we recognize them in the space. And this depends on our recognition of these different letter forms. So if you look at the center white area there, you might see that those resemble different letters such as H, O, P, and E. And our mind creates that process to uh, solve this puzzle of this figure ground relationship and this mass of points and use the negative space to call out those different letter forms. And we can see how points find their way into a lot of different aspects of our lives. Now, a line is an infinite series of points. When we think about a lot of points put together, that creates a line. And typically a line has some sort of length, whether it be short or long, it can connect two points together. Lines can also appear around the edges of objects. This is what we refer to as a stroke in Adobe Illustrator. And we can also think about the negative space or the placement between shapes that might identify lines, such as over here on the right between these two gray boxes. Now lines are drawn either with a brush, a pen, a pencil, they can be mouse, uh, or excuse me, created by a mouse or digital code. And they can be straight or curved, continuous or broken. In typographic layouts, characters group to form lines of text. And this can be rendered through a lot of different styles and ways to articulate lines, whether again, they're straight or curved. And that's honestly what we use in design a lot of times to articulate different textures or different feelings or moods of say an illustration or some sort of design concept. Now again we can see the accumulation of these different lines that start to resemble this word fear that is articulated through continuous lines and we can see the density that helps us read this word again depending on our previous knowledge of the letter forms. Same thing being done here as well. Now, again, lines can be found in everyday life, whether it be bike, stro uh, bike stokes, spokes, or cracks in the sidewalk, or cable lines. We also can start to depict space and form within the overlapping of lines and the way that they are shaped. When we think about typography, we use lines to identify alignment through either baselines of text or different vertical guidelines to help us align different elements within text. We also have planes. Now, for the sake of this assignment here and for what we're referring to, we are thinking of planes as a flat surface that is extending in height and width. And a plane can either be parallel to the picture surface or it can start to skew and recede into space like we see over here on the right. 
Now for this assignment, again, we're only gonna be using perfect squares, perfect equilateral triangles, and perfect circles to articulate these different uh, principles of design. And a plane can either be solid or it can be perforated. It can be opaque or transparent, textured or smooth. We also think about the field of text as a plane built from different points and lines of text that create some density on the page. Graphic object that encloses a three-dimensional space, that has volume. So that is typically going to be something that has some sort of height, width, and depth. And the angle at which these elements recede reflects the position to the viewer and how that is shown in a three-dimensional form. And we can see that being used here through these different planes that create this sense of space for this typographical letter form, uh, alphabet here. And again, planes can be found in our everyday world, whether they are found within the bricks in the sidewalk or different buildings or different parts of the um, street infrastructure, such as stop signs or different uh, parts of the sidewalk here. So why are we looking at these points, lines, and planes within this exercise? And how can designers use them in projects to solve these design problems? Well, when we start to think about the design principles, we can use these basic elements to start to show how we can perceive these principles within a visual form. And we can see that a lot of design really is based off of these basic elements and how they're used within a wide variety of different designs and different styles. Now, although graphic designers frequently use typography in their work, they're also often required to communicate using visuals alone. And this can be difficult at first, but when you start to have a better understanding of these principles of design and these sort of emotional reactions that can help us to leverage these ideas and communicate things more clearly, we can start to identify these easier. Now, we're gonna go over a couple of the different principles of design. And again, just to review, when we are talking about the elements of design, we're talking about the points, lines, and planes. Now we are going to move into the principles of design. And the first principle of design that we're going to look at is balance. Now balance in design is similar to balance in physics. A large shape close to the center can be balanced by a small shape that is close to the edge. Balance provides stability and structure to a design, and it's the weight distributed in the design by the placement of your elements. Now, the first principle we are going to review is symmetry, and symmetry is a form of balance. Symmetry is when elements mirror from side to side along a common axis. And symmetry can be either top to bottom, left to right, diagonal, or both. We can see symmetry being used in all three of these different compositions by utilizing points as the design element to articulate those. Now, when we use symmetrical balance, this is achieved through the use of identical compositional units on either side of some sort of axis. And this is typically going to create a more passive, more formal space to the design. So you might think about things like wedding invitations or some sort of flyer for a graduation potentially these often are going to use some sort of symmetrical balance to again, showcase a more passive and formal space. We can see two examples here, first on the left with a Nike ad that's using this symmetrical design to create these dynamic lines with a contrast of colors and creates movement that puts emphasis in the center of the design where they use negative space to showcase the product. And then over here on the right, we're looking at the Taj Mahal, which is a perfectly symmetrical building. Now this is obviously architecture, but we can see that it still creates this formal space and it makes this sense of a passive and symmetrical balance within the both of these examples. Same thing here, we can see the use on the left by the artist Shepard Ferry, who uses a lot of symmetry within his work to create a strong hierarchy. And sometimes this can be used to save time. And we can think about the use of the center of the page as a strong point of emphasis. On the right, this 
book cover is also using a symmetrical design to showcase the different aspects and parts of the story. Now, in contrast to symmetrical design, we have asymmetrical design or asymmetry. An asymmetry is when elements are placed organically, relying on the interaction of form and negative space to yield tension and balance. Asymmetrical design means the balance is without symmetry. It is possible to achieve balance without symmetry so that the placement of the elements of varying visual weight will balance one another around a fulcrum point. So we wanna use asymmetry to draw attention and create more visual interest, sometimes creating a more dynamic composition that has more tension. Oftentimes asymmetry is attributed to being more active and using a more dynamic space than a symmetrical design. And again, we can see this here with this example of this asymmetrical balance on the left pulled from the Bauhaus movement. And this is the, uh, the use of scattered typography and different shapes and forms to create different scales that are still balanced within the composition, but have a much more dynamic look and feel than the previous examples of symmetry. And then over here on the right, in contrast to the Taj Mahal, this concert hall is in the Canary Islands and it is a sort of cantilever arch over this building. And it has this asymmetrical element that tapers over the left-hand side. And it really does activate the front of this building. It creates a lot of energy, almost like a wave that is moving over this building. We could see this being used in these designs here as well, a more asymmetrical design, still seeking and achieving a sense of balance within that asymmetrical design use. So those are the first two principles of design, symmetry and asymmetry. The next principle of design that we're going to discuss is emphasis. And emphasis is where an element or elements within a composition contain a hierarchy of visual importance and typically the most visual importance within a design. So emphasis is going to be the parts of the design that you look at first. Now, oftentimes we think about this within the use of typography, right? A strong sort of headline is going to be larger and going to be the first thing that you look at. And then you are going to start scaling down the text to show different levels of importance to that portion of the typography. Now we can do the same thing with our design elements. Now it's no surprise that the first thing that you probably look at within this design is the large red circle. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's larger than all the other elements within the space. It is a different element using a circle instead of a square. It has a brighter color red, which typically uh, grabs our attention more than say gray or a darker red. But even beyond this single point of emphasis, we have additional focal points and ways that we might start to group other elements together. So the first thing that you looked at was probably the red circle. And the second thing that you probably looked at was the sort of maroon squares within the space. And although those aren't larger or a different shape than the other gray squares, we tend to sense and create some sense of unity and order within things that we look at. So we can see the use of emphasis here and emphasis is a huge part of design. Typically things that are bleeding off of a composition show a high level of emphasis because it almost feels like they're breaking the compositional box. Now the next uh, principle we're gonna look at is positive and negative space. And positive and negative space is one of the building blocks of design. Positive space is going to be the shapes of objects such as text and or graphics within a design. And then the negative space, which is also known as white space, is the shapes that's around those objects. Now, sometimes this can actually tell an additional story like we can see here within the logo for the Pittsburgh Zoo. Now, the tree and the birds are the positive elements within this design and this logo. But the negative space or the white space here is also identifying and defining these different shapes of both a gorilla and a lion over on the right. Now, when we think about these being used together, this can be very, very effective for the use of logos and storytelling within different design images. This is another example of positive and negative space where the positive space is the hair of the girl and the negative space is the black area here. And if you're familiar with the story of Brave by Disney and Pixar, 
then you know that it's about this young girl who uh, comes in contact with this bear. I believe it's her mother that is transformed into the bear. And so in this single image here, just by this very simple positive and negative space, we're starting to get a glimpse into the story behind this movie. The next principle here is unity. And just like we talked about previously, unity creates a feeling of wholeness. And it's usually achieved when the parts complement each other in a way where they have something in common. Unity can be achieved through the use of the same colors or different tints of it, or even using similar graphic style for illustrations. Now, if you've ever gotten several publications from a magazine, you'll probably notice that magazine's covers use unity to identify a style that is typically repeated within different issues of that magazine. Even though the image may change and the typography and cover stories may change, the overall unity of all of the uh, magazine covers using the same logo placement and the same coloring for their logo and the same general layout, that is creating unity within the space. Now, another example here is the use of unity through the branding of this shoe company. And the shoes themselves have this texture and bright colors that are used within the prints of the shoes. And they're bringing that onto the actual packaging here and even into different brochures that have to do with the company. And this is a very creative sort of solution where they actually hand tore each one of these papers to again, tie back into the unity of this brand and this concept. The next principle here is scale. And scale is the associations of size related to a constant size. It's a unit of measurement or a relative whole such as the human body or picture plane. And it's really about the size of something in relation to something else. The dimensional element defined by other elements of design relative to the surrounding elements. Now scale is the size of an element as it relates to usual physical size. So when we look at an advertisement like this used by Target, one of the reasons that this is a conceptual image and uh, is very effective is through the use of scale. Now, we as shoppers have a general idea of the size of a grocery cart. And when we think about the relative size of that grocery cart, these objects that we see would typically have no problem fitting in a grocery cart. So the designer here is using scale to create emphasis on these particular elements here, showcasing these different products that Target is carrying to get ready for summertime. Now, within the use of this project here, you're going to be using points, lines, and planes to articulate all of these different principles. And we can see that being done here in a very similar way of points to articulate scale by the use of this comparison. Now, if we look in the top left, the two points are the same size. So we really have no idea if those are intended to be large points or small points because we have nothing to compare it to. But as soon as we start to make changes to one of those points, we start to identify the scale in relative to the other object. So we can tell that this one is smaller here in the center left over versus the center right. And even within the use of color here in the bottom left-hand corner, because it is a darker color using black versus this greenish yellow here, it almost appears to be larger and it creates this sort of illusion of scale through the use of um, color. Now scale is really effective here. We can see a direct comparison to different skyscrapers in New York. And we can also see the use of scale creating emphasis and how these two principles tie together over here on the right for this advertisement by McDonald's, which is showcasing an earlier start time of serving coffee at 530. Now for this assignment, uh, for part one of this assignment, I should say, you are going to be going through a series of exercises, starting with sketches and then using Adobe Illustrator. And you're going to be using points, lines, and planes in square compositions based on the rules that are shown in the module, you must use seven or less of the 
same shape to communicate the design, depending on which element you are focusing on. And you are using that concept to describe the principle listed below each square. Now there is a video tutorial video in the learning module where you can learn how to make these basic shapes and work with different masking of layers to uh, articulate these different sketches that you're going to create. So to begin this project, you're going to start with different sketches based on these principles, working with points, lines, and planes. And you can see an example of that here for the principle of chaos and repetition, which we'll get into in the next lecture. And you can see that they are using only points, only lines, and only planes. Again, planes being perfect circles, perfect triangles, and perfect squares within these sketches to articulate these different principles. Once you have finished all of your sketches, then you're going to be working in Adobe Illustrator to graphically translate these sketches into vector elements in Adobe Illustrator. And again, we can see the use of points showcasing asymmetry on the left and lines over on the right showcasing asymmetry. And these are just different examples here that you can go through. So that concludes the lecture for the visual principles part one. Please reach out if you have any questions.